Amen. John chapter 15. John chapter 15. I, I, I just, I'm pulling from a text between chapters 13 and chapter 17 of John. Uh, I just love these, the, this passage because it was the last few hours that Jesus had with his disciples. It was just those last few moments before he would ultimately be betrayed and, 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 and arrested and, and then crucified. And we know that he rose again. But in those intimate times between John 13 and 17, Jesus had a conversation with his disciples. And I wanted to pull a passage from 15, right smack in the middle of that moment of what Jesus was talking to his disciples about. It reads this, starting at verse number 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, greater love has no one than this, that a person will lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for slaves does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because all things that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit, and that your fruit would remain, so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. This I command you, that you love one another. You know, with Thanksgiving ending this past week, many of you are now setting your sights toward Christmas. I know that yesterday, after being home, uh, we got away for a few days over the holiday of Thanksgiving, and we got home late Friday evening, and on, on Saturday, we spent the day uh, kind of turning our sights toward Christmas. We had put up a few trees, you know, we have some tree, trees, we have four in our house. Yeah, but I like, I like them too. But, uh, but we have four trees in our house, and uh, we, were, we had started a little early before we had left, but we got back, we were finishing them up yesterday, and, and just enjoying the holiday with our daughters who are all in this weekend. And uh, we, we, we know that that's what you're doing. You're beginning to focus forward toward Christmas. The season of year can be a very busy time for many. For all of us, Thanksgiving and, and, and Christmas, but falling uh, back to back, it's easy for us to, to be focused on this time of year. It's between these two holidays that can become countless hours beyond your normal workload or getting, uh, of getting ready and getting your home ready for what comes next. And as a family of six, I can get it because we, we, we've celebrated one day and now we're turning our thoughts to another uh, holiday that's just now 25 days away for all of us. Getting our gifts ready, getting our home ready, getting our home decorated if you haven't done that. All of those things that are going on, I get it. Well, in the busyness and in the exhaustion of, of, of these two celebrations, it's easy to overlook the significance of the seasons because we get caught up in the busyness of it all. One leading us to gratitude. And I want to thank Pastor Ty for leading last week so well and talking to us about fervent gratitude Last, last week, with the other introducing us to love as we lean into Christmas. You know, the meaning of Christmas can be easily lost in the midst of all the tinsel and lights. Yet, regardless of how it has been packaged, whether it's invited or rejected by you, Christmas still stands as a hallmark of God's greatest gift to mankind, and that is His Son, Jesus Christ. And with the giving of His Son, the truest meaning of love. If I can add one last name as we conclude our series this week to our fervent list, it would be the name Jesus. Amen? He is a fervent person, a fervent individual. Paul saying about Jesus in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, Jesus already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by coming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. We know that Jesus left his Father and he entered the world as we entered the world, through the womb, made in the likeness of men until the day he gave his life on a cross for our sins. It was his birth and death that spoke of his fervent love for us, with Jesus only further teaching us what love is between those two moments. 
If we turn a few chapters back from our text to John chapter 2, we find the opening story being the first recorded miracle of Jesus. Jesus turning water into wine at a wedding that he was a guest at. With the second story in chapter 2, starting at verse number 13 of Jesus carefully braiding a whip. And I need you to think about this. He, 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 he just turned water into wine. And now in this second story that they're highlighting, he's braiding a whip. A project that actually took time, meaning that he was thinking about what he was going to do. It was premeditated, okay? He was braiding a, a whip, going, down, or go, going into the temple where he found people selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at the table. And the Bible says with the whip, he began to drive the animals and the people out of the temple, overturning their tables and pouring out the money with the disciples remembering Psalm chapter 69 and verse 9 where it says, For zeal for your house has consumed me. He says Jesus began His ministry. He began with the miracle of conversion. Changing water into wine. With His second action being a work of cleansing the temple. Isn't this how Jesus longs to work in His people? Isn't this how He longs to work in each of our lives? First, conversion, change. You and I coming to a place of faith. But second, cleansing, washing your sins away. Jesus telling Nicodemus just one chapter later in John chapter 3 and verse 16, some, a verse that's all familiar, familiar with all of us, that God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus only stating that His mission was to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus was fervent. He was zealous he was zealous in His love, seen in His coming, His birth, and His going, the cross, along with everything in between those two moments. He came to love, and He came to teach us to love while He was here. You know, when Jesus was asked by a curious Pharisee, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? He said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with your, all your mind. This is the greatest and foremost commandment. And the second is like it. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. You see, the answer that Jesus gave illustrated the life that Jesus lived. He didn't speak something that He didn't do. He only spoke what He was doing. It's what He displayed. It's what He modeled in His life. The question that you must ask yourself as we look at this person, as we look at Jesus, because He was a person, He walked as a man, as you look at Him on this fervent list, as you, as you think about Him, the question that we must ask ourselves this morning, as you acknowledge the purpose and life of Jesus is, how does His life change your life? Because His life should impact you, amen? His life should change the way you live. And if I can simplify that question even a little further, let me ask, how does His love become your love? How does His love, how He loved in this world, how does it become your love that you attain and live and practice and model? By us looking at Him as our example, we find our how. Jesus, number one, loved the Father. He loved the Father. You know, there's no better way to see the love, of, see the love Jesus had for His Father than on the night that He was soon to be arrested and betrayed. In a setting of prayer, Jesus simply asked His Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. How many remember that? You know, from chapters 13, John 13 to John 17, He spent those intimate times with the disciples. They moved on to the Garden of Gethsemane, and it was there He began to pray. And that's how He started His prayer. If you're willing, remove this cup from me. Jesus knew His friend would betray Him in a matter of time. He knew that the cross was looming in front of him. He also knew that, that bearing the cross would be a very difficult task. Yet instead of focusing his prayer on that one desire of, Lord, if this cup can pass, so let it be. Jesus said, yet, yet not my will, but yours be done. Jesus' display of obedience to his Father's will was a sacrificial act of love. He was being obedient to his Father. In our text, Jesus reminded each of us, do what I command you. Now I want you to think about that. How do we love the Father 
well. How do we love the Father as Jesus loved the Father? What did He do? He was obedient to His Father and to His Father's will. And Jesus only repeated in our text, He says, do what I command you. Jesus cited our obedience in our text with His own future actions modeling what He commanded. Not only did He tell His disciples to do thus and so, He did thus and so by being obedient to His Father in those moments. Again, you'll be obedient to what He asks of you. Why would we do that? Because He knows what's best for each of our lives. When we understand who the Father is, when we understand what He has done for each and every one of us through His Son, Jesus Christ, it's easy in that moment to be obedient to Him. Paul reflects on this debate between the Creator and the created in Romans chapter 9 and verse 20 when he wrote, The thing molded will not say to the molder, Why do you make me like it? Why do you make me, excuse me, why do you make me like this, will it? Who better to know that what the purpose of something is than the one who created it? You just think about yourself. If you, if you, if you crafted something for a specific task, you're the one who explains it to others, right? You're the one who says, this is what it was made for. This is not used to be a hammer. You know, it was made to be this. And whatever it was created for, you were able to explain that. Well, I want you to know today that the one who made you knows you better than you know yourself in life. Obedience in its purest form is love For your Creator, acknowledging His love for you and your willingness to walk in His love and all He's planned for you. Because He knows why you exist and what you were uniquely created for. You see, Jesus was born. Jesus came for a purpose. And that was to fulfill His Father's will. He was born for a purpose. He was born for His Father's will. Jesus understood that purpose and He followed through on that purpose. The verses just before our text, Jesus said this, Just as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. And He said, Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in His love. Do you see the connection? Jesus loved the Father Simply because he knew what he was here for. And when he walked in his father's perfect plan for his life, it was simply a sacrifice of love. It was was showing love to him by being obedient to what he was on the earth for. And Jesus is only echoing the same thing to his disciples. Do what I command you. Do what you're here for. And when you're obedient to the word, when you do what I tell you to do, You're you're loving the Father well because He's the one who created you and allowed you to exist. Secondly, this morning, Jesus loved the Father less. You know, there's a world all around each of us. Some of us acknowledge it. Some of us try to ignore it. We just get up in the morning. We dodge as many people as we can and get our life done so we can get back home. But there's a world all around us, a world who has yet to understand our last point. They don't know the Father, nor His love for them, nor His purpose for their lives. Therefore, they're unable to love Him with all their heart, soul, and mind. They choose to follow themselves. They choose to love themselves. This, again, is the reason why Jesus came, the reason for the season we're in, to reveal the love of the Father to a world who's never experienced His love. This is why Jesus gave us the command You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The second of the two greatest commandments. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 31, And yet I'm going to show you a far better way, leading his readers into a conversation about how to love others in the love chapter that we're familiar with, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm going to show you a far better way. Well, there are two sides to this coin. And I want you to see both sides this morning. The first side being this. He said, love one another. Well, as Jesus sat with His disciples on that night before His betrayal, He said in John 13, 34 and 35, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just that one line is powerful in itself because He just introduced something new. You know, we have the Ten Commandments, but now He's just introduced something else. Jesus said, I give you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you and you also love one another. By all this, people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. See, Jesus was talking about those who've come to know the love of the Father. 
Those who were striving to live in obedience because of their love for their Creator. You know, how many in the church, I'll put that in air quotes, the church can potentially display hate in the world? Think about it. How many can potentially display hate in the world? Before you experienced the Father's love through the coming of Jesus, you were fully invested really in what the world taught, being partakers of the world. But because, you, but because, but because of your now obedience to Him, your desires has become to love God first and second, others. Our desire should be to love others. And that starts inside the family. It starts within the house, with those that you're seated with in this room. The family of God. We choose first to love one another. Well, as family members, we should not, we, we should not only know this, but it should be practiced in our lives every day. One, on the same night of our text, before Jesus had, and the disciples relocated to the garden, Jesus prayed over the moments to follow. And we find that prayer in chapter 17 of John, and we're privileged to actually have be an audience to that prayer. And in chapter 17, verse number 20 through 23, he prayed this, I'm not asking on behalf of these alone. We know that Judas had already left the table. We know that he had went to betray Jesus. There was only 11 and Jesus. And he says, I'm not asking on these alone, these 11, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have been given me, I also have given to them, so that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, and they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me, and you love them, just as you loved me. Paul urged the church of Ephesus in chapter 4 and verse 3, be diligent to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. For his church to walk together in unity. And if I can simplify it, for you to not walk, for, for you to not walk with your brother and sister for whatever reason, not only causes his church to walk divided or separated, but you're saying, I choose to live in opposition of what Jesus prayed for. Think about that, church. When we sit in this building today and we have conflict with one another, or we choose not to walk hand in hand in unity with our brother, with our sister, what we're doing is we're contradicting the very prayer that Jesus prayed over your life. That we walk together in unity as you and me, Father, are one. We, I pray that they are one. That we learn to get along. That we learn to, 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 to partner together. That we learn to love each other. Instead of being diligent to live together in unity, striving for peace. Sometimes we send this message that I'm not a disciple of Jesus. We're not a disciple of Jesus. Because if we argue and fight against one another... What are we actually saying? How are we living? We can say one thing. I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. I love the Father. But if you hate your brother, your fellow brother in the Lord, or if you strive against him or set your face against him, or you are angry with that person, does the love of Jesus work within that relationship? We have to ask ourselves these hard questions because, once again, this is what Jesus prayed for. He prayed that the body of Christ, you and I, would love one another. Jesus said that when we abide by the command of loving one another, one another, He said, all people will know that you are my disciples. Not some, but all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. What are you, going to walk, what are you, go, what are you doing to walk in unity with one another? That's a question that we must ask. Are you harboring ill feelings with a brother, with a sister? If you find yourself not liking or holding unforgiveness, I urge you this morning to ask the Lord, what is in my heart that I'm not willing to forgive or befriend? What, what's in my heart that I'm not willing to pull that person close to me? I said to the first service this morning, I, I believe that two people who love Jesus can work through anything. And two people who love Jesus can walk together in unity. And two people who love Jesus can be friends. 
Now, the personalities may be different. We may clash sometimes, but that's okay. That's the uniqueness of the body. That's the uniqueness of who we are. Personalities are different from person to person, and that's okay. If we're all uniform, that's kind of bland. But we can just look at the landscape and see how God likes design, right? And He made us a part of the landscape. And we're all beautiful in His eyes and we all hold talents and giftings and, and, and uniqueness that is uniquely you. But He's asked us to walk together in unity as the body of Christ. Some, as Paul said, so, everybody can't be the ear. Somebody has to be the hand. Not everybody can be the hand. Somebody has to be the foot, right? He says we're a part of a body with Jesus being the head. And together we move. And together we work our unique giftings for His glory, and for His praise. So if there is something in your life where you're not walking in unity with a brother or sister in Jesus, can I just encourage you today to have that conversation with the Lord? First, we need to say, God, forgive me. We have to repent. Repentance is a turning away. I'm not going to live that way anymore. And second, we need to begin to be fervent in our love for one another. Loving each other. And walking in unity together. And there's a, if there's a conversation that needs to be had, have the conversation. Maybe you need to go say, I've har- harbored ill feelings against you. And I'm sorry. Who knows whether or not they will become your best friend simply because you had the conversation. You know? We don't know. It's just something in our head that says, I don't like him or she doesn't like me or he doesn't like her. When Jesus said, I pray that they be one, they love each other well. So that one side of the coin is that we love one another. May we live in such a way that our obedience to God is more important than our preferences. Amen? Which leads me to the second side of the coin. Not only did he say love one another, he said love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. Love the ones not in your house. Again, there's a world all around each of us. A world who has yet to experience God's love and unable to love Him in return. Yet there's a far better way, as Paul reminded us in 1 Corinthians 12, that we have been used to used to form to from our excuse me from our natural selves. That's what we're used to. There's a far better way than our natural tendencies. This this play of love is more than emotion, it's a lifestyle. It's what we become as we walk this life out. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave Himself up for us. Stay consistent in your walk with God. Be consistent in that walk. Again, they will know that you are a disciple as you are consistent in that. If you're not consistent in your relationship with God, many will wonder if you really love the one you claim to serve. It's kind of like if on the day that Jenny and I get, got married, we said I do, and the next day I go out with my ex-girlfriend. How would that go over? Not just with her, but with you. What would you think? Well, he's not really committed to her, is he? You know, it wouldn't look right. And therefore, how does it look in this relationship? You know, are we being consistent in that relationship? Well, like Jesus, love may ask you to make a sacrifice. It may ask you to do something that is hard. It may ask you to do something that is difficult. Jesus choosing to die even when you were in your sin. Romans 5, 8 saying that, but God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus placed a value on people even at the loss of his own life. He willingly died so that we could go free. Well, love starts with value. It starts with you seeing those outside of the family holding value. Meaning that when you see an unbeliever, in spite of their beliefs, in spite of their behavior, in spite of their lifestyle, in spite of their truth claims, whether a person lives a life of virtue or he's living a life of vice, We have to understand that Jesus died for them. That He died for them. And are you willing to seek them out even in their mess and in their confusion? I think about Jesus who sat 
with the Pharisee, or excuse me, he sat with the, with the publicans and the sinners. He sat with tax collectors. He sat with people and the religious folks said, what are they do? What is he doing? Doesn't he know the type of people that he is hanging out with? I'm not saying that we be like them. I'm saying that we have to be available to them for the love of Jesus in us to be modeled to them. That means we have to engage the lost. Engage the lost and realize that you're not going to like their lifestyle because it's not your lifestyle anymore. You might not like, you might not like their, their, their truth claims because your truth claim is based on the Word of God. You may not like their attitudes because maybe they're arrogant or maybe they're prideful when you're trying to walk a humble life. But regardless of where they are, just know that Jesus walked the path before you did. He walked it before you did. He sat with them and was criticized for it. But we as a church must learn to say there are people out there that still doesn't know the love of the Father and know how to love Him. So we're, in Jesus' example, He loved the Father less. And He went after them. And that shows us that we must be willing to do the same. Are you willing to provide nourishment to the spiritually starved? Well, fervent love will cause you to leave the 99 to find the one. It's like the story that Jesus shared. The shepherd come in and he's counting the sheep as he's putting them in the sheepfold. Three, four, 28, 35, 98, 99. Where's the other one? I have a hundred. And he closed the gate. He put his coat on and he went back out looking for the one. Because he was lost. The sheep was lost. And he valued the lost one over the 99 that were found. If that doesn't paint a picture for us, church, I don't know what does. That we must value people, no matter where they are in life, because you were one of them. I was one of them. I was in my sin. I was in my junk. You were in your sin. You were in your junk. But yet Jesus loved you before you even were saved. And when you stepped into that relationship, you discovered something amazing. You discovered how to love the Father. And He's wanting you to lo learn to love the Father less. You see, that requires a sacrifice at times. And that's how Jesus loved you. While you were still in your sin, He died. He sacrificed. He dealt with your sin. If you're not willing to engage sin, you've become indifferent to the sinner. And that's not love. Would you... As a loving husband, sit back and watch your wife choke on food? Would you as a loving mom allow your kid to touch a hot stove? Would you as a loving friend watch your friend drown in a pond and do nothing about it? No, because that's not loving. To love means you get involved in their lives, you nourish and cherish just like you do for yourself. Love doesn't ignore the loss in someone's life. It seeks to provide what's better for them. And if, if you're going to love like Jesus, then we have to live like Jesus. Live like Him. And that means that we love our neighbor. That you love your neighbor every day. So in loving the fatherless, we all think about this, we love one another because we were fatherless at one time. But we also have to love those who are truly fatherless. And live the life that Jesus lived and what He prayed over you and what He asked us to do beyond these four walls. You see, as we find ourselves moving toward Christmas, ask yourself why Jesus came. It wasn't so that you could put a tree in your house or put lights around the eve of your home. He came because He loves you and He longs for you to live in His love. And the question that I have is, will you strive to be fervent in your love? Jesus is on the list. He's fervent. He's fervent. He's fervent in His love. And He is our example today of what that looks like. Love God through your obedience. Love one another through striving for unity and peace. And love your neighbor through the willingness to sacrifice like Jesus so others can know the love of God. How about it? Is that you today? Do you want to up the ante, if you will, on your love for others?